Welcome to the Lowenstein Sandler podcast series. I'm Kevin Iredell, Chief Marketing Officer at Lowenstein Sandler. Before we begin, please take a moment to subscribe to our podcast series at lowenstein.com slash podcast, or find us on iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, Google Podcasts, and SoundCloud. Now let's take a listen. Welcome to the Crypto Innovators Podcast, presented by Lowenstein Sandler's Crypto Practice. I'm your host, Eric Schwartz, Senior Counsel and Vice Chair of Lowenstein Crypto. We're speaking with the most innovative founders and operators in Web3 to shine light on the technologies that fascinate us all. I'd like to introduce you to our other host, Leah Satlin. Hi, I'm Leah Satlin, Tech Group Counsel, specializing in IP and commercial contracts. Today, we welcome Pat White, CEO at BitWave for part one. Thank you so much for having me. This should be a lot of fun. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thanks for being here, Pat. We want to start with a little bit about the history of BitWave, if you could tell the viewers. Yeah, so the, the history of BitWave is, is kind of intimately tied to my history. So my, my name is Pat. I'm the CEO. My background is enterprise software my entire life. My first job out of college was with Microsoft. I've been at Microsoft and Intuit and Fortify Software, did software security. Did a long stint doing CRM and ERP implementations for companies. I got into crypto early on. Like I got a version of the white paper, you know, I actually got the white paper delivered to my inbox and immediately loved it. I'm an engineer by trade, computer engineer. So the white paper was a really clever solution to a very difficult computer science problem. So I loved it essentially right away. I ended up doing a little bit of mining back in the day. Nothing to write home about. I think I, I spent all my Bitcoin paying my rent one month, actually, as it just so happened. Worst ROI ever. I ended up sort of you know, looking around in 2010, 2011, if there was a startup to do in crypto, because I'm, I'm sort of a startup guy. You know, There was not an enterprise startup to do in crypto. And so I kind of put my head down. My current co-founder and I went and we started another company, sold that to Cisco. And, and when we were coming out of Cisco, we sort of looked around and it was around 2017, 2018. And there finally was companies like it sort of there was this funny point where you went from no companies in the world touching crypto to companies with US addresses and domiciled in the US and Delaware C Corps, they're going to actually pay taxes. I don't say that because we started out to build a tax product, but just because it sort of shows the maturity of an industry. Like when it's all just kind of fly by night, you know, people like you can't build an enterprise software business on a bunch of, you know, avatars with, you know, Git names and that's it. There has to be like a US company that's going to do something that cares about security or accounting or the actual like infrastructure, whatever it is. So about 2017 is when that started happening. You saw, you know, Chainlink, Galaxy, Nidig, all these companies popping up into existence that were all real companies with real headquarters doing real stuff with digital assets. And so my co-founder and I basically sat down and said, well, okay, let's, let's figure this out. Like, we basically put together like a, a spreadsheet and we just at the top said, what problems will businesses run into with crypto? I think back then we probably said Bitcoin, but that's really the heart and soul of BitWave is we are here to enable the next 10,000 businesses getting on to digital assets. Like there's companies like MetaMask that are saying, how do we get the next you know, 10 million users and next 10 million like you know, retail users? That's, that's all good. We, we love those companies because that's a very important part of the story. But we focus on how we get the next 10,000 businesses and what are all the enabling technology that they need. Obviously, day one is tax and accounting. Like you, you cannot touch digital assets without accounting for it. And I, I often will say like, it's really accounting than tax because businesses account, you know, you have to close your books every single month. You pay your taxes quarterly or yearly. So it's one of those funny things that everyone in the retail space, you talk about a retail company doing this, uh, tax is what everyone talks about because individuals don't care about accounting. They don't account for their staking revenue on a month over month basis. They, they do it once a year. And the only reason they do it is because of taxes. But businesses are very, very different. Like I, I always like to say the difference between accounting and tax in some ways is like everyone kind of hates tax because you're, you're paying the government, you know, it's giving the government their share and, and no one's really happy writing that check. People actually like accounting because accounting tells you how much money you're making. It's one of those fun things that like, it is really good to know how much money you're making People love making money. You want to know. Accountants tell you how much money you're making. So it's a good thing. So people tend to like the accounting side almost more than the tax side. So we had this whole, whole list of different problems that businesses are running into between you know, how you orchestrate complex transactions. You know, We talked a little bit about self-custody. We think businesses are eventually going to be doing a lot of self-custody and what that looks like. And of course, then at the top of the list was accounting and tax. And so we started building that product up. 
had our first sale sometime in you know early 2018 and have just been kind of going gangbusters since. And now we have, you know, over almost 300 clients. We process about 5% of all crypto transactions. Like literally about 5% of all crypto transactions get accounted for through Bitwave, which is billions and billions of transactions a year. And it's really, really fun. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you for that. I was hoping you could go into a little more detail on the specific services that you provide to businesses in the crypto space. You've already kind of touched on a lot of it, but. Yeah, absolutely. So Bitwave is a entire back office solution for businesses that use digital assets. If you have a business that's using digital assets, you end up with a lot of complexity around those digital assets as it relates in particular to accounting and, and tax. The example I always like to give that will resonate with people, like let's say for being on this podcast today, I, there was no money that changed hands here. But let's say I, I was going to send you guys both one Bitcoin for letting me on this, this podcast today. So I, I go to my wallet, I send you one Bitcoin. It takes me like seven seconds to do that. From that one single transaction, I've essentially created four obligations for my business. This is also where like individuals don't really care about this stuff, but businesses care very deeply because obligations tend to have either governmental oversight or fees or jail time or whatever whatever relates to the, the particular obligation your business has. So I send you one Bitcoin, takes me seven seconds. There's four obligations created. So first and foremost, I need to account for that. So I just disposed of, you know, today it's what, $19,000 worth of company property. That's going to go into my general ledger as, you know, credit, digital assets, debit, marketing expense for this today. That's me. I fair market value the Bitcoin and I book that. Second, I just disposed of, even though it was sending, the treatment is the same. So if I'm sending it or if I'm just selling it on the open market, it's, it's basically the same treatment. I just disposed of one Bitcoin for $19,000. I did not acquire that Bitcoin in 19. I acquired it at 20 or 50 or five, whatever it is I, I got it at. So the delta between those two is my, is my tax obligation. That's my, my gain loss for tax purposes. Third, I might have a compliance obligation. Like I just sent you guys $20,000. In the US, that requires me to do a 1099 MISC or some sort of like W9, you know, whatever it is, company to company. Like there is a reporting requirement. In, in 2024, I'll have to do an 8300. You'll have to do an 8300 form on this. There is some sort of compliance obligation that gets picked up by me sending that much money around the world. And then fourth, if I am a US company following US GAAP, I actually pick up an obligation that is, I might have a separate accounting treatment than tax treatment. And this is sort of where things get really, really crazy about crypto is it's really common for someone to have a, for accounting purposes, to use a inventory relief methodology like FIFO. Like everyone's familiar, this is first in, first out. So you will use, for accounting purposes, you'll use FIFO with impairment, which is a, a methodology where you actually mark the asset down, but never mark it back up. So you basically take a, a P&L expense and then that PL expense gets offset by a larger realized gain when you dispose of the asset. We can get into that more if anyone's interested, but it's a fun part. But then tax, you don't do that. Tax, whatever you sell the coin for is your cost, you know, as you're disposed, whatever you bought it for is your cost basis. Like there is no modification of the cost basis. And with tax, you can use something like spec ID. So we will often see people with like spec ID for taxes, FIFO for accounting purposes. And as soon as you do that, you've essentially bifurcated your tax and accounting books. And you actually have to keep track of two separate realized and unrealized gains and losses that you might have to put in your system. So there's these four obligations that come up. And, and what Bitwave does is we basically go to the blockchain. We track all of your transactions on blockchain, on exchanges, on anywhere that you might have a transaction. We help you account for it. So we give you a bookkeeping interface that says, hey, you got one Bitcoin deposit. This would be you guys. You got, you got one Bitcoin deposit today. What was it? Oh, it's Pat White gave me some marketing revenue or our sales services revenue. By doing that one action, which is that, that one sort of thing of, of categorizing that transaction, we then give you all of the other components as a sort of a happy side effect. So getting sort of more technical on the accounting side, we sort of help you build a base ledger from this sort of day-to-day -day bookkeeping. So you build up a base ledger, and then we help you project that into multiple adjusting ledgers. So from the base ledger, we project it into a tax adjusting ledger that gets you your tax realized gains or losses, a US GAAP adjusting ledger that gets you US GAAP realized gains and losses and impairment expenses, and then anything else you need. DeFi adjusting ledgers, management reporting, all of those things are quite easy in Bitwave. There's a whole bunch of other stuff around treasury management and DeFi and all these crazy things, but that is the heart and soul of what we do is, is basically make it very easy for you to account for your digital assets. Amazing. 
Not to be redundant because it sounds like, you know, these accounting and tax issues are probably the biggest challenges that businesses are facing when they start operating this space. But do you want to elaborate on like that, sp any specific challenges that you see businesses facing and that they should be thinking about when they enter into the crypto space? A lot of the challenges tend to be, as with all things in, in human society, they tend to be human problems, not technology problems per se. I mean, some of the tech is is tough, but like you have solutions like Bitwave out there so that any business that wants to do this can get into it. It's more like, you know, different companies have different levels of how powerful their CFO is. I know it's sort of a funny way to say it, but like if you're a startup, your CFO doesn't exist. So he's very, he's not very powerful at all. If you're a Fortune 500 company that reports quarterly earnings and you don't have a charismatic CEO like Elon Musk, your CFO is probably the single most important person in the company. And so you end up in this situation where like, if you are, let's take General Electric. I have no inside information. So this is purely hypothetical, but GE is, you know, they're sort of split between a very large finance org because they do, you know, all the, the loan servicing and all that kind of stuff. And then they're, they're kind of product side. Their CFO is an incredibly important human being, incredibly, incredibly influential at GE. If GE is like, hey, you know, Bob, we're gonna we're gonna buy a billion dollars of Ethereum, he's gonna be like, ha, 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 ha. no, 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 we're not, no, we're not gonna do that today. You end up in this sort of like person issue of of getting it over both your CFO as well as then a lot in a lot of situations you actually have to get approval from your board. If you're a public company, you'll have an audit committee on the board. The audit committee on the board has to approve you putting any significant portion of your treasury into digital assets. These are people problems. These are problems that people just don't necessarily, they don't understand the technology. They don't believe in the technology. They don't know about things like Bitwave that'll make it easy to sort of handle it. So that's sort of one of the challenges that we see public companies running into is just how you get this past your audit committee and all that, that piece of it. The other side that's really interesting that we see is, is once you get into digital assets, you realize very, very quickly so there's this world that everyone kind of thought digital assets would make accounting easier. And over the long term, that, that very well might be the situation. But today, that's not the case. You know, maybe five years from now, accounting will be completely automated and it'll be, it'll be a really, really cool world we live in. Today, that's not the situation. And so you basically, as opposed to a bank account where when you make a transaction, you see a line item text on that bank account transaction, you know, Wendy's, <laughs> McDonald's, like you know, GoDaddy buying that. And you basically can give a lot of autonomy to your accounting team because they can look at McDonald's and on the on the line of a bank account or a credit card statement, and they know that that was a employee meal or a travel meal or whatever, whatever it is. Crypto is not like that. Crypto, you see two addresses that are 32 character, 24 character, random strings, and you have to basically turn that into, into some sort of knowledge. So you end up having this feedback loop that you need to have between your accounting team and your ops team, the people spending the money and the people accounting for the money that you actually don't always have in the real world. Now, there's a lot of stuff you can do to get better at that. One of the things that we talk about is something called wallet hygiene, which is, it's, I think it's a, a term we coined, or maybe one of our partners coined it. The idea is if you're really good about segregating use of wallets, so you have one wallet where you always pay marketing expenses. So when I pay you guys for this, this meeting today, I promise no money to change hands for this. I have a wallet that's called you know podcast marketing expenses. And I pay from that wallet. And then my bookkeeper can write a rule in Bitwave that says, hey, anytime you see money going out from this wallet, automatically categorize it as podcast marketing expenses. So we call this idea wallet hygiene, where if, you, if you're really good about segregating your expense wallets, your revenue wallets, all the different things that you want to do, and you take that very seriously, you can make your life a lot easier. And that's something that we, we end up doing a lot of process work with folks and like how you define that, how you segregate those wallets, all, you, all that kind of stuff. The other piece of that that I'll mention is a lot of our clients come to us without necessarily thinking about a lot of the controls. Like crypto, because you are controlling your own money, you should be thinking about it like you have a bar of gold sitting in the in your like in your laptop bag or or in the back of your room or something. So like if you if you thought about it like that, you would immediately your brain jumps to like Fort Knox. We're gonna have guards, we're gonna have contingency plans, all this kind of stuff. People tend to come in and not think that way. We've seen clients come in that have. One, their their co-founder has a MetaMask on their laptop with you know ten million dollars on it. It is a fundamental risk to the business. It's a risk from a fiduciary controls perspective. It's a risk from a like if you were to ever go public, like you can never have anything like that. There's there's socks issues. There's control issues. There's monitoring issues. All this kind of stuff. And so 
is one of the things to also think about is there there is an OPSEC piece of this of how do you properly secure all of your various keys? How do you make sure that you have access to the funds that you think you have access to? All that kind of stuff. And that's, you know, again, we're BitWave. We we have some solutions around there that we kind of help with some of that stuff. That's my advice. Wallet hygiene. If you take nothing else from this podcast, as you get into crypto, just just think about segregating wallet usage for different activities. That's some incredible advice, Pat. I mean, I think folks at home should definitely take it super seriously because I know from our perspective, those are some of the biggest hurdles in representing startup companies in this space and and projects all across the world. They really need help with those things. And typically, like those are the sort of first hurdles they have with respect to accounting for digital assets on their balance sheet or Mm -hmm. as revenue. So we couldn't agree more. Next question we have for you. We know that you provide some optionality on the counting of receipt tokens issued by lending protocols. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, this is a great one. So I'll set this out by just sort of setting the stage with BitWave in general is that we take optionality very seriously. It's one of our catchphrases. It's one of the things that helps us win deals and all that kind of stuff is that it is the difference between a retail product and a enterprise product, to be quite honest. Like, you don't tell enterprises how to account for their stuff. Like enterprises tell you how to account for their stuff and you and you make your system work with that. And so one of our first customers used cost averaging. This was before the IRS had released a lot of guidance. And I didn't think it was right. To be honest, even back then, this is like 2018. Like even back then, I'm like, ah, this is kind of squishy. Like it doesn't seem like you should be doing cost averaging on digital assets. Like it really, this seems more like stocks than like Forex, but whatever, that they were doing cost averaging. And, you know, you have two options. You either tell them, you know, pound sand and, and walk away. Or you say, all right, we'll, we'll support that. And so very early on, we support FIFO, cost averaging. We added spec ID on the accounting treatment. We were the first people to ever have impairment. I mean, everything, you know, we basically do whatever our clients kind of ask for. So where that gets super fun is DeFi because so there's, there's a few different places where there's a ton of open questions in the space that our kind of mentality comes into play. So the first one I'll talk about, which is which sets the stage, is ETH to wheat. So this is one of the biggest debates. I don't know if you would call this a debate or just a lively conversation or what in the crypto accounting world and the crypto tax world is when you convert Ethereum to ETH, which is wrapped Ethereum for people that aren't familiar, it's ETH that is smart contract controlled to be linked to an ERC-20 token. That might not make any sense to you, but the important part to remember is there is no counterparty. It is a conversion of a token to another token that has no counterparty. The counterparty is the Ethereum network. It's all run off of a smart contract. And so the question is, is when I do this conversion from ETH to ETH, is that a taxable event or not? And about half of the big four say yes, half the big four say no. And even within the big four, you'll have different groups in the big four actually disagree on this. So we've, we've gotten like two different customers that have the same big four auditor that have different advice on how to do the treatment here, which is just part of the fun of, of the crypto world here. So you have to be able to set is that taxable or not? So we have this whole process where you can basically, you go in and you, you know, the bookkeeper always does the same thing. The accountant, the accountant, the corporate accountant just goes in and sets it as a trade, but then you on as the tax manager can go in and you can set up wrapping treatments behind the scenes. So you can say, okay, ETH to ETH is taxable. Or ETH to ETH is accounting gain loss or whatever you want to do. That sort of sets the stage is that we, we tend to think about this in terms of you are going to get sometimes conflicting advice from different people. So you have to be able to support whatever it gets into. DeFi is the same way. So when I go into a DeFi liquidity pool, like let's say I'm going into a Uniswap pool. If people aren't super familiar with that, the way it works is that you go in with with two tokens and you get a liquidity pool token back. The underlying mechanism is that you have to put in two tokens that approximately have the same USD value behind them. So I'm going to put in, you know, let's say one Bitcoin and 10 ETH is about like that's about what the ratio is today. So I go to a liquidity pool, I put in one, one Bitcoin, one 10 ETH, and I get out an LP token. There are a lot of questions about how to do that treatment. And honestly, is completely and utterly unsettled law in every form of the term. So what you might want to do is you might want to do a very, very simple tax treatment, which is I'm disposing of the BTC, the ETH, and the fee. Like That's super important because there's also a fee component. I'm disposing of those three assets and I'm acquiring that LP token. I want to transfer that. I want to carry forward that cost basis. By itself, that's something that BitWave does that I don't think anyone else really does, but it's that by itself is actually super, super hard work. 
No one does that. Like, you don't, when you go to TD Ameritrade, you don't trade like three, like two Microsoft, one Tesla for one Apple. Like, that's not how it works. Like, you dispose to cash and then you buy back to cash. So, we actually, the way our gain loss matcher works is you can have any number of assets on the dispose side, any number of assets on the acquired side, and we'll like make it work. We will look at all the fair market values. We will figure out which has the larger market cap, and then we'll either carry forward a cost basis or carry backwards a cost basis, and then apply it proportionally across the assets based on their fair market value. I know that was a real quick hit on that. Happy to go into it deeper. But suffice it to say, our gain loss metric can handle these really crazy things like multiple assets on both sides of a, of a trade there. So that's that's one way to do it. And And actually, to be quite honest, there's a very real world where that is the tax treatment that you always use. So for your tax books, you always use a full disposal and reacquisition and, and acquisition of the LP token for it. Okay, that's step one. Step two is where things get complicated, <laughs> as, though, as though they're not yet complicated. So I'm going to go into a liquidity pool of this BTC and this, this ETH, and I don't want to remove this off of my balance sheet. So I want to take the accounting position that, in fact, the BTC and the ETH are still on my balance sheet for accounting purposes. Maybe for tax purposes, I do want that disposal, but for accounting purposes, I don't. So we'll help you track that deposit into the liquidity pool. There's a lot of different ways you can kind of handle this, but the way you can think about a liquidity pool, it's a big bucket of these assets and anyone can kind of add or subtract assets at any time and moving the bucket into alignment with kind of a, a target of, you know, ha- like half of the assets are the BTC, half are the ETH. You want to make sure those two those two values are the same. So those those prices are constantly changing. So what we can do is we can track your deposit in the liquidity pool, potentially pick up any trades that happen along the way. So there's a lot of there's a lot of ways that you get into these liquidity pools. You might actually execute a trade for like let's say USDC into ETH to get into this into this pool. So you might you what leaves your wallet could be BTC and USDC. What hits the liquidity pool is going to be BTC and ETH. So you've already picked up a trade there. So our system will pick up that trade. We'll then look at your balance at the end of the block. You might have picked up another trade due to movements within the block. So as other people are trading on that liquidity pool, they call it impermanent loss, but your position in that pool might have already changed. Then once you're actually in the pool, there's kind of different ways you can do the recognition. We can pick up a daily transaction that rebalances your holdings on your wallet to what your holdings in the pool are. So let's say the price of ETH, you know, 10X is. And so suddenly it's one ETH to one BTC. The pool will reflect that. So your holdings in the pool actually go from, you know, 10 ETH to one BTC to one ETH, one BTC. That's, that's what you physically have rights to remove from the pool. And so we can actually pick up a trade that says, you know, you just disposed of 10 ETH and acquired 0.1 BTC, something like that. And then we'll actually pick up that trade to keep your balance in the pool lined up with reality. You can also do something even more complicated, which is you can look at the full flow through of the pool at the time. So depending on your big four auditor, this is where it gets fun. Your big four auditor might have the opinion that you are a general partner in a liquidity pool. So if you are a general partner in a liquidity pool, then essentially you have full exposure to your assets as part of movements within that pool. It's You are essentially participating directly in that pool with your own assets. That's how general partnerships work in America. And so if that's the situation, then essentially any trade on that pool is a, is a trade is a proportionate trade against your, your assets, in which case you need to track a very large number of trades and you're churning through your own inventory as, as part of it. And we can create that transaction as well. Finally, if you're doing something like, so this was all about liquidity pools, which is really complicated. If you're doing something a little bit simpler, like compound, like you're going into a compound pool and you're earning interest on it, We'll just pick up that interest event. So you'll just see a deposit into this account that you can control uh, that just shows the interest that you're accruing every single day. And there's a lot of complexity there, but it's it's pretty easy to do. So I know that was the 100, 200, 300, 400 level class of these things. That's how much complexity there is once you get into DeFi accounting. There's just, there's so many different knobs to turn. There's so many different, like there's so many different people to make happy. You're making your tax auditor happy. Your advisor's happy. Your accounting auditor, everyone has to be happy on this stuff. There's a lot of conflicting and competing advice that you have to kind of balance. (laughs) That makes a lot of sense. And I think what's crucial to take away is just like the optionality that Bitwave is able to provide. Because frankly, I mean, that's something that we offer as part of our services as well. And I think 
that's how you can be a helpful advisor and service provider within the crypto space because optionality is key. It's an ever-changing and ever-evolving regulatory environment. So I think it's suffice to say that we try to provide the same types of solutions and also look forward to see what is the most likely outcome of these evolutions that are occurring simultaneously. Yeah. And, and we couldn't agree more that optionality is crucial. It yeah. is everything. Yeah. I mean, it's honestly what makes it so fun to be quite honest. Like uh, a few months ago, one of our customers is a Canadian customer following US Gap. And so they're doing cost averaging, but they wanted to do impairment. You know, I don't think anyone in the entire world has ever built impairment for a cost averaging solution. Like it's 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 really really fun to do this. Maybe maybe someone on your side, like you know, in one of the uh, in Excel book or something like that. But from an actual productized solution that is that is running by you know that like thousands of users and stuff, I don't think anyone's ever built that. So it's it's fun to be on the cutting edge defining these things that no one has ever contemplated before. Like how do you impair? cost average assets. I mean, normally impairment is lot by lot. And so when you apply that to cost averaging, you're suddenly like, it's it's kind of a, a bit of a, a mind uh, twister, brain twister, but that's what we deal with every day. And it's super fun. <laughs> Agreed. I mean, that's definitely our lives as well. And then we love the opportunities to do it and it keeps us on our toes. And it also keeps us really excited about what's next because we just, we get that next project in and we we get to think about a whole new world and a whole new place and really help drive forward what the project's trying to accomplish. And then with that, so can you tell us just a little bit, and obviously I think what's most important is we want to kind of lay out sort of the full services that you guys provide. And one of the latest sort of avenues that folks have become really interested within the crypto space and that we've been working with clients on extensively is NFTs. So can you tell us a bit about the Bitwave's NFT accounting solutions and offerings? Absolutely. So we are fundamentally, we are a enterprise SaaS product. So at the base level, it's a software product that you sign up for and you pay for on a monthly, monthly or yearly basis from that perspective. So that's kind of the entry point. We have kind of the base user license, which gets you access to a lot of what we're talking about today. We have something called the advanced accounting module that gives you access to SOX level controls for role-based access. We have a pricing module that gets you really, really fine-grained control over pricing. So that's what we haven't even talked about pricing. You guys want to talk about that. Like it's like every part of crypto that you like, they're like these scratch and sniffs that you like scratch it a little bit and suddenly you're in this like black hole of discussion. But pricing is incredibly complicated. Like the idea of how you determine your principal market on an asset by asset basis, and then how you actually use that to price assets and how you handle that changing month over month. We have a whole pricing engine that enables that. So that's under the pricing rules engine. We then have ability to do impairment and all that sort of stuff as part of other modules. So it's per user per month with modules on top of it. The other piece, of course, is we do have an implementation group that helps. We have not set out to be a process defining company and implementer and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, like, there's not that many people who can do this stuff. Like there really is very, very few people who can walk you through how to create FBO and treasury processes for custodians with their accounting books today. And that's something that we can do. So we have an entire solutions team that can both implement Bitwave, but can also help guide you through a process of defining your wallet hygiene, defining your flows, figuring out certain accounting treatments. We don't tend to make recommendations. We don't write memos, but we can tell you, hey, here are 10 different ways that people handle these really, really complex accounting issues. Pick one and we'll make it happen. So we have a full solution team that can help with all that kind of stuff. And then we have an engineering team that in addition to sort of supporting the product can help get data from difficult to reach places, including internal blotters, blockchains that no one else is integrated with. We support 20 to 30 blockchains at this point that no one else in the world does. I mean, Mina, Casper, Immutable X, we have full crawls of all that data and can do really complex roll-up reporting on it. You know, A lot of our customers are doing 40, 50, 100 million transactions a month. So that's, you can't just stick that into NetSuite, <laughs> right? Like you can't, you can't go from Bitwave to NetSuite with 40 million transactions. I mean, probably nothing would make your NetSuite rep happier. I think they charge by the thousand transactions. <laughs> so you, you can make your NetSuite rep really, really happy trying to do that. But we have a lot of tools for how you actually roll that up between point A and point B that you will do through our implementation journey. So that's us in a nutshell. It's, it's sort of a SaaS product that has everything from the accounting tax. We have an operations product where you can do bulk bill payments in crypto, not trying to compete with the people doing like the on-ramping, off-ramping from fiat. But really, if you pay your contractors where you hold crypto and they want to get paid in crypto, 
we have a really easy way where you can automatically pay them in bulk from the uh, UI, automatically categorize everything and, and make your, this is one of the ways you make your accountant's life a little bit easier. If you use a wallet that pre-categorizes transactions, suddenly you actually don't have to worry as much about wallet hygiene. So it's kind of like, if you actually use our ops product, you can pre-categorize your transaction, which then means it gets picked up by your accountant as like categorized and they just have to approve it and you're ready to go that way. So lots of products up and down the sack. We have a lot of stuff coming out in the treasury world right now. I love the term treasury because like crypto treasury is sort of this really fun Rorschach test of like what everyone thinks it's a little bit of a different discipline, but we have a lot of stuff to help you monitor your treasury, monitor yield, do cash flow projection, all that kind of stuff. So lots of different products up and down the stack and, and uh, modules within the, uh, the system. Thank you again, Pat, for joining us today for part one. And for all of our listeners, before you go, if you enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to subscribe and hit the like button. Thank you for listening to today's episode. Please subscribe to our podcast series at lowenstein.com slash podcast, or find us on iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, Google Podcasts, and SoundCloud. Lowenstein Sandler podcast series is presented by Lowenstein Sandler and cannot be copied or rebroadcast without consent. The information provided is intended for a general audience and is not legal advice or a substitute for the advice of counsel. Prior results do not guarantee a similar outcome. The content reflects the personal views and opinions of the participants. No attorney-client relationship is being created by this podcast and all rights are reserved.